Science is really helpful for answering important questions like can sunlight be used to generate electricity or even how much lint is found in the average belly bug? But what if a scientist said something like, I invented anti-gravity boots. You did. Or, I can shoot lasers out of my eyes. What? <laughs> How can you know when to trust what scientists say? Should we just automatically trust them? Or is there some sort of test that we could use to tell if they're on the up and up? Great idea. Here's a test, and it only has three questions. You can have more confidence in the statements that scientists make when they pass the test of these critical criteria. If scientists fail this test, their science is likely to be low confidence junk. I'm looking at you, phrenology. Ah, uh, yes, this person is an imbecile. Wait, what? Let's look at how scientists approach a hotly contested question, how did life begin? At the simplest level, this question only has two possible answers, with scientists on both sides. Number one, either nature did it, or number two, nature uh, didn't do it. Most mainstream scientists are in the nature did it camp. So let's see how they do against the three criteria. Let's reveal criterion number one. Are the scientists unbiased? If you were in a science fair and your mom was the judge, the other students might well be suspicious if you win the blue ribbon. Scientists are human and sometimes root for one particular outcome, and that can be bad. You did great, sweetie. But when they are so biased that they don't even consider other possible answers, that's really bad. And we shouldn't have particularly high confidence in their conclusions. Applying this to the origin of life, what do these scientists do? Remember, the origin of life question only has two possible answers. These scientists start by completely excluding the second possibility, and then act as if they aren't biased. But shouldn't we remain open to consider? Quiet. Excluding one of the two possible explanations before the research even begins is the ultimate form of bias. Because of this, the question has been subtly changed from how did life begin to how did natural processes begin life? To practice good science, we need to be aware that we could be wrong and that our biases can lead us astray. We ought to consider all of the evidence and follow it wherever it leads. Let's look at criterion number two. Did the scientist avoid making assumptions? Assumptions are like shortcuts. They can be helpful in saving time. Hmm. But if we're not careful, they could lead to the wrong place. <laughs> Because the origin of life is a one-time historical event, and we weren't there, we need to make some assumptions. But are those assumptions at least minimal, reasonable, and openly disclosed? With the origin of life research, that's a no on all accounts. The assumptions surrounding the conditions of the origin of life are maximal, and rather than being reasonable, they're often laughable, and frequently hidden as well. It's one thing for Betty Crocker to assume that you have tools like a clean bowl and spoons, an oven, those cute little paper thingies, fresh ingredients like eggs, oil, water, and importantly, the know-how to follow instructions to make delicious sprinkle cupcakes. It's a completely different thing for origin of life scientists to assume that no instructions, no tools, no usable ingredients, and no one to not use those non-existent things could eventually make a living cupcake, the first life. They assume that chemicals can become supernaturally high in concentration and supernaturally pure, but everything we know about chemistry and physics says it didn't happen. Take a look at this review paper. It summarizes all the efforts so far to make the building blocks of life. For example, this experiment used 15 molar of ammonium cyanide solution. What's that mean? Well, take a bottle of soda. It's pretty sweet. Don't drink too much. You might get diabetes. But as sweet as it is, it's only about 0.3 molar in sugar concentration. Imagine boiling it down so much that you triple the concentration of sugar. Ugh and then multiply that concentration by 15. Ugh, you could eat that with a fork. And just in case it needs to be said, this kind of concentration is wildly unreasonable. Why does concentration matter? 
Well, the molecules need to interact or bump into each other. That's what chemistry is. But they won't unless they're concentrated. It's like dodgeball. It's only fun if there's a certain concentration of people. 30 players in a gym? Nice. 30 people in the whole zip code? That's not as fun. Hello? But that's not how nature is. Nature is also full of impurities, unwanted chemicals that get in the way of desired reactions. Imagine not only were there no other dodgeball players nearby, but there were tons of very grouchy bodybuilders ready to end you. Chemical concentration and purity matter. Again, their assumptions are laughable. Okay, so they're cheating a lot a bit with the starting ingredients. Do they at least come up with high yield rates that are easily usable for future experiments? The short answer is no. And the longer answer is no. Look at these yield rates. 0.012%, one to 5%, even the highest, best yield rates, again, that's with all of the supernatural cheating, are a measly 75%. For context, reagents with a purity of 95% are basically seen as low quality garbage, only fit for throwaway student work and not real experiments. These experiments yield literally nothing that is actually usable, and indeed, scientists don't use them. Once they prove they can make an ingredient, they assume that gives them license to purchase new, pure, concentrated ingredients to use in starting the next reaction. This cheat is so common that it's been given a name, Relay Synthesis. Well, once these ingredients have been cheated into existence, they won't just sit around for millions of years waiting for an opportunity to turn into life. Like a perfect world with everlasting yellow bananas that never turn brown and yucky. They've all got expiration dates, often as little as days, or even minutes. Perhaps most shockingly of all, they disregard all existing evidence and assume that not only a self-replicating molecule came together on a prebiotic Earth, but that there were a very large number of different self-replicating molecules. An assumption so large that it is hard to even fathom. And the magic wand of evolution, natural selection, requires self-replication. So not even that can help with the origin of life. Sorry. The cherry on top of all of these assumptions is perhaps the biggest hiddenest assumption of all, the human involvement. All of these steps didn't just happen. Things don't just get to 600 degrees C for 1.5 hours, followed by heatings at lower temperatures, 75 to 310 C for several tens of hours. Who's gonna take them out of the oven? The reality is this, their assumptions involve cheating, injecting human intelligence at every step along the way, and stealing components from existing life. They make huge assumptions, any one of which is enough to stop any hope of chemical evolution in its tracks. Finally, criterion three. Do the scientists make reasonable claims about the results? Scientists are not tabloid writers. They have a responsibility to present the results accurately, not to embellish, exaggerate, or amplify their findings. For example, a tenth of a percent improvement shouldn't justify a claim of phenomenal results. Molecular biologist Sol Spiegelman started the excitement over a self-replicating molecule with his 1967 paper boldly titled An Extracellular Darwinian Experiment with a Self-Duplicating Nucleic Acid Molecule. Wow, a self-duplicating nucleic acid molecule. The only problem was it wasn't self-duplicating. How could scientists blatantly exaggerate like this? Isn't science supposed to be getting at the truth rather than baseless hype? Hmm, science, what are you doing? No! It's unfortunate, but scientists in the origin of life field are known to hype and misrepresent their findings. In 2007, Gerald Joyce called out the unreasonable claim made by Spiegelman's paper, admitting, today, Spiegelman's molecules would not be described as self-duplicating. The original paper, therefore, had a misleading title, exaggerating the results. The 60s were indeed an interesting time. Today, it's not much better. In this same paper, Gerald Joyce boldly claimed, 
chemists can benefit from reflecting on Spiegelman studies and the subsequent advances, which have taken the field to the brink of the generation of life itself in the laboratory. Wow. Way back in 2007, we were on the brink. We are this close? Let's see. 13 years later, in 2020, Joyce published another paper humbly titled, An RNA Polymerase Ribozyme That Synthesizes Its Own Ancestor. Did they finally figure it out? Or is Joyce having his own Spiegelman moment? Well, this study had nothing to do with a prebiotic earth. Scientists stole things from already living creatures and engineered a molecular machine with the goal of having this machine copy itself, since replication is a pretty big requirement for starting life. And it failed. No problem. How about instead of copying itself, let's have it copy a smaller molecule. Okay, they let this guy try over and over, hundreds of times, thousands, millions of times. How did it go? They showed that it would require about 160 billion attempts for this little guy to copy a molecule that was about half its size. And even that required lots of human interaction and encouragement for the little guy. But in the end, they did it. They created a molecule that failed 99.99999% of the time. And that's not even the worst part. The copied molecule was riddled with errors. It was about one million times worse than the sloppiest DNA replication process of all known life. So they concluded, the fidelity of RNA polymerization should be considered a major impediment to the construction of a self-sustained RNA-based evolving system. So does this sound like being on the brink of creating life in the lab? If not, then these guys are exaggerating just a bit. And this is just one of dozens of unsolved challenges for origin of life scientists. Perhaps we should be a little bit skeptical of their results. Yeah, but science is progressing. Just give it time and we'll have a true self-replicating molecule. Is this a problem that time can solve though? The world record in high jump competitions has increased over the years. But if the goal is to have a human jump to the moon, well, then we need to recognize that more time isn't going to help. That will forever be off limits to jumping. More than five decades of work on self-replicating molecules still leaves us a factor of one billion away from a self-replicating molecule. Oddly similar to how the human high jump is about a factor of one billion short of reaching the moon. We can know that these origin of life scientists are promoting bad science because they are biased in the extreme, excluding all other possibilities before they even begin. They make the most sweeping assumptions possible, cheating all along the way. And their results are exaggerated beyond recognition. Yeah, but even if all of that was true, evidence against chemical evolution doesn't count as evidence for the opposing hypothesis. Well, actually, when the stated hypotheses are a dichotomy, as in this case, evidence against one does indeed count as evidence toward the other. This entire series of videos covers much more evidence that supports the second option. In ignoring the criteria that point towards truth, origin of life scientists are producing results with extremely low confidence. Their work ignores the fundamental basis for producing confident scientific results, preferring rather to propagate the bias and worldview of the scientists under a thin veneer of science. If you'd like to learn more about the criteria that provide confidence in science, we recommend reading The Scientific Approach to Evolution by Dr. Rob Stadler.